Hello, everyone, and welcome to Exploring Cinema. I'm Nate. And I'm Dylan. And I'm Adam. Today, we're continuing our month of romance. Yes. On the show and talking about a movie aptly titled True Romance. Mm -hmm. A lot of other stuff is on there as well. Romance in its truest form, I think we all agree. Mm -hmm. The most passionate, I think. Yes. For sure. (laughs) uh, Adam, would you like to tell people what True Romance is about? Yes, True Romance from 1993. In Detroit, a pop culture nerd steals cocaine from his new wife's pimp and tries to sell it in Hollywood, prompting the mobsters who own the drugs to pursue the couple. (laughs) You know, you just can't (laughs) get away clean when you steal cocaine from your wife's former pimp. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just never a clean getaway. Never. As much as you'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. Well, would have been if he wouldn't have left his ID. Yeah, very (laughs) foolish thing to do, really. Um, This one was fun because the three of us actually got to watch this together, which doesn't happen that often. We watched this last Friday night, Mm -hmm. had a really good time. Um, And Dylan, you had seen this before and Adam and I I had not. Yes. Yeah. How long ago had you seen it? And it was was fun for me. Uh, Years, uh, probably like uh, five to ten years ago. A okay. while ago, I saw it for the first time, and I remember it being like kind of fun, but also not my favorite. And then, you know, but it definitely I mean, it has some kind of iconic scenes and cameos. And I, this is a fun pick uh, for me because I know y- you hadn't seen it. So this is a fun movie for me to just look over at you guys every like yeah. two minutes because mm-hmm. there's just something cra- like ridiculous happening about every two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And Adam, you had mentioned in our kind of previewing February episode that this was the movie you were looking forward to the most of the four that we were going to be talking about this month. Yeah, I, I I thought this one would be pretty zany and pretty fun and kind of out there and a little bit more. I mean, we just watched um, uh, Wild at Heart, and I figured it'd be very similar to that because uh, I really enjoyed that. And mm-hmm. uh, and it was. It was very similar in certain ways. It was a lot more over the top, I think, than Wild at Heart. Um, Ooh, that's a... In its own way, so yeah. Wild Heart has uh, what's his name, Bobby Peru. Yeah, Bobby. yeah. Bobby Peru's tough. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of equal parts. Maybe that one's yeah. maybe that one's a little bit more gross or something. But mm-hmm. um, no, I thought it lived up to some expectations. Uh, it definitely fell flat on some of the storyline. Uh, I think, but the zaniness we'll, really gets to it. So yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, yeah. Before mm-hmm. we do, however, let's uh, dive into at a glance. Uh, True Romance from 1993, directed by Tony Scott, written by Quentin Tarantino, mm-hmm. right between uh, Reserv- Reserv- Oh my god, the show Reservoir now throws Dog. me off every time. Yeah. Reservoir Dogs. Uh-huh. Not Reservation Dogs. Fiction. Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. He wrote this right between... I think he wrote them between. He could have written it earlier, but it came out right between. And he, and Tony and Scott, he didn't direct, of course, which is the kind of outlier. Correct. Yeah. Directed by Tony Scott. This is his second most popular movie on Letterboxd. I think I'm going to start including that for the directors here for okay. kind of what we're what we're talking about with that like glance. His most popular movie on Letterboxd is Top Gun. Okay, and I then mean, he had a wow, he had quite a few successful or at least noteworthy '90s movies that you might be familiar with. He directed Crimson Tide, which I have not seen. Mm. Uh, submarine movie with Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman. Okay, and then okay. he also directed Enemy of the State with oh. Will Smith and Gene Hackman, which Dylan, I know you and I have seen. Adam, have yeah. you seen Enemy, of, Enemy the State? of the State? Yeah, I believe so. I think that'd be up your alley. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then uh, Dylan, this one's for you. Twelve point five million dollar budget. You want to guess how much money it made? Oh man, like thirty to forty. Adam, any guesses? Like nine. Twelve point six. Ooh, ooh, wow, interesting. Yep. Okay. Big cult following after. I'm guessing this had a lot of uh, like since probably a lot of DVD sales and like some VHS sales back then too. Oh yeah, I, I bet like um, after Pulp Fiction came out, I'm sure so many people went back and yeah. found True Romance and Reservoir Dogs. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, accolades: ninety three percent on Rotten Tomatoes, seven point nine on IMDb, and a three point nine on Letterboxd. So well reviewed movie across the board. <laughs> yeah. And then this just blew my mind. Uh, a list on Empire in 2017 of the greatest movies of all time. This was listed at number 83. No way. That's pretty surprising. I will yeah. say. <laughs> I mean, I had a lot of fun, but <laughs> number 83 all time. I don't know about that. 
Well, in 2017, that's what Empire thought. They re-released that list last year, and it's not on there anymore. So, <laughs> interesting. I don't know if they've soured on it or if you know, just I mean, Portrait of a Lady on Fire knocked it off. Yeah, I think it definitely. It certainly hasn't aged well in some regards. It's it's dated a bit. Yeah, and I don't think that's working in its favor. Yeah, we'll get into that for sure. I uh, mm -hmm. want to remind everybody before we continue to like and subscribe, make sure you get notified every time we do one of these deep dives. We do about one a week here, mm -hmm. and then we've started to do a preview of each month as well to kind of tell people what ties the movies together and what we're going to be watching in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, next week's movie is going to be City Lights. Yeah. Uh, none of us have seen it. I understand there's a romantic element or pursual that's a word pursuing in this movie uh okay. so that's why we included it here and thought it would be a really good opportunity to finally watch a charlie chaplin movie so i'm really looking forward to city lights that should be a lot of fun but back to the movie at hand true yes. romance opening statements uh adam what do you got i had a star-studded film that has more than enough energy to justify its zaniness Okay. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. A lot of energy in this yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it helps that it's like cocaine, but I was gonna say that, that is a drug. So yeah. Yeah, it's drugs, violence, sex, those just all kind of rotating around. And yeah. Elvis. And yes. Elvis. And, and oh, rock yeah. and roll. And so. comic books and movie yep. references. Mm -hmm. Everything. Lots Everything. of pop culture. So mm -hmm. much pop culture. Yeah. Um, Dylan, you want to go next? I, I'll go last here. I think I feel slightly differently about this movie than you guys do. Oh, yeah. Uh, I will go next. Um, my opening statement is that true romance is unhinged and out of control. Uh, <laughs> a young, uh, fresh and recently skyrocketing to fame Tarantino is apparently unsupervised on dialogue and plot, which overall works to this film's detriment. Uh, it's not just a mixed bag. It's like a mixed bag of angry badgers. <laughs> i okay. really I, I like that i agree with that. yeah i yeah that's pretty in line with my opening statement which uh -huh. is that this movie feels like it was written by a 16 year old boy who had never left his house before yeah yeah i i saw your letterbox review and I, and I do agree with that i think it's i think it's it's interesting how i think that's like it's true and also a 16 year old who had never left his house before is what 90s hollywood was craving like they they want you know like as a result of him never leaving his house and being a weirdo who watched movies 24 7 yep <laughs> but it yeah. definitely it's like you can see that coming through in the dialogue especially with the romance story it's this so is just the most like <laughs> teenage male fantasy movie i can possibly imagine yeah and it's yeah. also one of those movies where this happens a lot where a character is supposed to be like kind of an introverted nerd, mm -hmm. which he kind of like isn't when we meet him, but then like his boss sort of through Alabama, like says he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he's played by Christian Slater, who by mm -hmm. all accounts is a very attractive man. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's one of those deals where like casting makes it sort of hard to believe that mm -hmm. this guy just like works in a comic book shop and doesn't know how to talk to people. Yeah, because once yeah. we see him talk to people for like the entire movie, he's on top of everything. He's kind of crazy. His dad mm -hmm. is even like kind of acts like he's sort of nuts in like a dangerous kind of like an unpredictable mm -hmm. kind of way, which doesn't really match the works in the comic book shop and never goes outside side of him that his boss sees. Yeah. So yeah. there's just sort of a weird element there. And then just like, I mean, the the whole part of. She's a hooker, and then she just immediately actually falls in love with him. Yeah, like eight minutes into the movie, they, they the most, love like, each other. Teenage male fantasy thing I think you can possibly come up yeah. with. Yeah. That's actually the only time I thought it was super believable that she fell in love with him because Christian Slater is like an attractive guy. She was like, fuck it, that guy's hot. Like, I can get out. Like, I don't care what, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the only time I was like, oh, that works. But yeah, mm -hmm. it, did, it did feel very much like if he's supposed to be a nerd, he's like, a, a very very good looking dude who could pull you know what i mean so 
Yeah, it's weird. I think a lot of um, other writers or a different approach would have been like the slow burn where they don't actually are. They're not actually in love, but like she still doesn't want to be a hooker and he wants to help her out. And then maybe they're on the run together. And then by the end of the movie, they fall in love. But Tarantino's just like, I don't have time for that. They fall in love immediately. Like, yep. <laughs> like their passion will fuel the rest of this movie. Mm-hmm. Yep. I want to get to the violence and the action. And the yeah, definitely. Quippy, yeah. Could be movie references. So I think we can jump ahead to defining moments then. Um, mm-hmm. I I listed five and okay. I kind of have them like every other as like bad and good because there were things I liked about this movie. And then there were things I think some of these, the scenes I chose kind of indicate where some of my issues yeah. were. Okay. Um, so the first one was Alabama tells Clarence that she loves him. I That was, I listed it as a, as a negative. Yeah. Just because I found it like, kind of to your point dylan like we didn't need to go that hard that fast <laughs> no <laughs> like she's just so sad that she was deceiving him they met like three and a half hours ago and she's crying yeah. about it and she's in love with him and that's that's what it is um yep. not a huge fan of that scene mm-hmm. um clarence kills gary oldman uh yeah. thumbs up yeah uh, it was a great scene <laughs> my favorite scene <laughs> love that and i <laughs> Adam and I mentioned this while we were watching the movie. I think there's a better version of this scene at the end of Boogie Nights, but it oh. felt like Paul Thomas Anderson had definitely seen True Romance. Mm-hmm. So that was cool. He was mm-hmm. like, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. This one is just like the acting's all really good and everything, but the Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walker walk-in scene, excuse me. Yeah, that one's aged the most. It's just like, what, like how, is, how does this make the final cut of the movie? It's just I, kind of insane to me. I, I I kind of, I don't know. That just did not work for me. And I just kind of the whole time was thinking like, how many more times are, is he going to say this word? And can we just be done with this scene and move on, please? Because yeah. at the moment, I'm still kind of mostly enjoying myself. And like the longer this scene goes, the the worse yeah. I'm feeling about what I'm watching. Um, also the good Brad Pitt talking to bad guys. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah Brad phenomenal Pitt. and should be in every movie. And I have a tidbit yeah. about that later. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. And then um, Alabama kills Tony Soprano. Yeah. Uh, I listed that as a negative because that scene was like five times longer than it needed to be. Yeah, it took five it days to shoot. Very yep. unbelievable to me. It was one of those scenes where like the bad guy can just kill her whenever he wants, but he's just like the the script and like plot dictates that he needs to toy with her to give her an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like he doesn't want Get to. Out of that's, there. Why, that's why he's like, just she's like, just tell me. And then he just punches her and is like, Well, then he's like gonna shoot her and she picks up like a little like screw yeah. or something. He's like, Yeah, come on, put it right here. Yeah, yeah. like try your best. And it's like, no, I'm you would just kill here. her. Like, you and just... then she just like stabbed him in the foot and he didn't just like shoot her right there. Like it, I don't know. That scene I didn't yeah. love. So those were my five kind of pros and cons of the sort of constant back and forth feeling that I had while watching this movie. No, I think that's, I think, uh, yeah, those are, those are all, I I would agree with most of those. I think the, I think the Christopher Walken, Dennis Hopper one seems like out of the whole movie, that's the one that just like, it, it aged the worst. Cause I feel like if that, if the movie had been made a few years earlier, no way is that like in there or that long. And then like, Mm -hmm. by like two, by like early to mid two thousands, I feel like no way is that, that low, but it was just in this one period of time in the nineties where like, it was edgy and it was like, Ooh, and it like it. So, but, but by now it's like 30 years old and it's like, Oh my God. Yeah. It goes yeah. on way too long, but um, yeah. So my defining moments, yeah. Brad Pitt just crushing his cameo. Yes. Every moment he's on screen, just perfect. Um, I Is also had considered uh, a cameo when he's not like a hotshot actor yet. Like he just got like a small role. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I, People didn't really, I mean, I think he had been in Thelma and Louise at this point, but it was like right around the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, I guess then like stealing his scenes. Yes, totally agreed. Anytime he's on screen, it's great. Um, I also have, yeah, uh, getting Alabama's things from Drexel's house, just that whole sequence. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was wonderful. I have uh, the the two bathroom scenes with Elvis I really liked too. Oh, sure. that That was an interesting device. You know, classic Tarantino kind of cool twist on Killer talking to himself was so that he can get so, so that he can bring Val Kilmer in to be Elvis, which is kind of cool. Um, 
And then uh, the the big standoff at the end, which I actually had forgotten about. Uh, I was like, really? Like, halfway through the movie, or like three quarters, or like halfway to three quarters. I'm like, okay, yeah, they're all gonna go out to LA, and I'm like, how does it? And then they were, and then I was like, oh yeah, okay, big standoff. But I I I, I like that. That's pretty good for for a standoff. I can see why it ended that way, and you know, guns a blazing and stuff. But um, so those are my those are my defining moments. And then also, I guess for a bad one would just be and what this defines this movie for me is the the soundtrack by Hans by a, by Hans Zimmer, which took me out of it. I I just I know that Adam was kind of with it and maybe it's a vibe and I'm sure it was done for a reason. And some people will totally disagree with me. But every time those little uh, what are they called? The steel drums or whatever. Anytime those the came marimba. on, it's just, the marimba, it just didn't. It felt tonally not right <laughs> it, it definitely didn't fit the mood and i was definitely trying to like see where they were coming from and there was a couple scenes where was like all right i can see where this like sort of fits but when it initially started like the the credit scene uh it was yeah it was it was very strange yeah um over to you adam yeah you guys have mentioned all mine basically uh the big one i had was the shootout at the end just because it's so massive yeah. and there's a lot of scope and all that stuff mm -hmm. but yeah clarence versus drexel and then brad pitt stuff a lot all the cameos honestly like dennis hopper yeah I, even though that scene is his age poorly they both do mm -hmm. well and it's i really like seeing a yeah. young uh um dennis hopper does pretty good as a normal dad walking. thank you christopher walken yeah like for the first for his first part his first few scenes he's actually like a normal person who yeah has regrets and is trying weird. to be a good dad and then he just and then just with that scene with christopher walken and then we don't even see christopher walken again after that, mm -hmm. just for that again. Scene, yeah every yeah then it's just it's just this let's just yeah it's like i don't know why they need to go there no. but i appreciated dennis hopper playing a normal person not a psychopath yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> up until that, nice. that part when like the, all that stuff starts great fantastic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally in but yeah so yeah those, those are mine all right. all right questions um what did i have oh yeah was this the beginning of the comic book nerds are actually cool stance uh... that kind of pop culture has sort of really grabbed onto in the last like i'd say decade or so Mm. I, I don't know if we're old enough know, to like fully really know, but have yeah, yeah. on this, but I'm just curious because I don't recall seeing movies from this time like fully leaning into mm -hmm. outside of like Kevin Smith stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. was like no budget nonsense for the most part. This was like a movie with a budget and like A list actors. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I, I felt to me this felt very much when I watched it this time. I, I kind of picked up on a, a very big like Gen X, like influence and kind of like the yeah. same crowd, the same crowd that was going to like Kevin Smith, like Clerks and stuff. Oh, it was like oh Tarantino's kind of like kind of almost this kind of humor mixed with action and it's like edgy but... and big and big actors and it's kind of like it has this very much like I'm being edgy just to be edgy and push the boundaries and like it has this kind of like attitude this defiant kind of attitude like the whole movie of just like eh, like <laughs> yeah I, I, I think, so i think part of that is is like bringing in yeah like the pop culture um specifically the the comics i felt it more with the movies I, i'm not sure how much action movies and just movies in general in the 80s and before this were referencing older b-list movies the way or like you know the way tarantino is just like constant references you know i didn't know if yeah, that was really that. Yeah. yeah before this i mean yeah some of those movies when he'd show just like someone's watching a tv and it just shows us like three seconds of what they're watching and then cuts away some of those are pretty bizarre yeah for sure <laughs> you that Anthony Hopkins one. yeah i'd say i think to answer that question uh, I don't think I'd say we probably can't tell because we're mm -hmm. probably too young. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like comic book nerds didn't get cool until comic book movies were cool. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Blade was like one of the first like comic book movies outside of like Batman. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, and that was like late nineties. I want to say early two thousands. But then we long hit, after this. Yeah, it, it was. I want to say it was like ninety seven, maybe ninety eight. Um, but then like yeah, when did Marvel start? Like oh eight, oh nine. Somewhere in yeah. that range. But I mean, they, they, you know, the, there was like the original Spider-Man movies. Oh, you guys, you know. sorry. 
Uh, yeah, and the, like the Spider-Man and X-Men stuff, and it was sort Batman of like the, super, the superhero stuff in the early 2000s just like the was just kind of like a random peppering of like, here's one movie, here's another movie. Yeah. We can kind of do this now, depending on who it is. It wasn't IP this, we have. It wasn't this explosive thing. It was like, hey, we're trying to see if we can make these cool animated shows come to life. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I, you guys cut out for me, so sorry if I yeah. glitched or something. I oh, you think. froze at a great face. Yeah, Sick. Like, cool. Yeah, enjoy that. Enjoy things. that internet. Mm -hmm. Can't wait. Can't <laughs> wait to see it because <laughs> we don't edit. So <laughs> yeah. All right. What do you guys have for questions? Anything? Um. Well, I, my first one was, "How did you honestly feel about the score?" But I already brought it up. So yeah, <laughs> we. You've shared your thoughts. What are? Yeah, and it didn't really bug at it when Nate. What did you? Did you? Honestly, it didn't make like a big impact on me either way. It was kind of forgettable. For me. Shit out of me. Ruin the whole movie. <laughs> um, and then also, I guess my my question was, uh, you know, I felt like, did you notice or would you feel like some of the differences were between this movie and any and any of other Tarantino's movies that he directed? You know, like I, that kind of like it was weird because it was like you got a, it'd be some scenes would be very Tarantino ish, but then like the music would come and it would be nothing that Tarantino would put in a movie ever. And it would be like yeah. super nineties mainstream. And then back to edgy Tarantino. It was like this weird mishmash. Yeah. This felt to me like the sort of uh, like when there's an album you really like, and then you find, and then the band like a few years later releases like six songs that didn't make the cut for that album. Uh -huh. And you get really excited about it. Cause you think it's going to be like the same quality as the rest of the album. And then you realize there was a reason why those songs didn't make the album. <laughs> That's how this movie felt to me. <laughs> like, like it's it sort of like a lot of like little disparate ideas that Tarantino had for like individual scenes or like a character that he couldn't really fit into anything else that he yeah. wanted to write. And mm -hmm. so it's just sort of like this little mishmash of like moments, which is why we, I think they were able to actually get, as big of a cast as they were because a lot of these roles are just like in and out, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like Gary Oldman's in like, I think two scenes. Yeah. I think yeah. And Christopher Walken's in one short. scene and Dennis Hopper's in like three scenes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, James Gandolfini's in it a little bit longer, but he wasn't huge yet. At yeah. this point. Samuel L. Jackson's only in one scene. Samuel L. Jackson is, I for, completely forgot he was in there. He just shows up to talk about one really funny thing. And then, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Make but, a quick quip uh, and I, get out. I think that's part of why they were able to kind of get who they got. Mm -hmm. Plus, just like Tarantino's dialogue is fun to act with. Yeah. Reservoir, Reservoir Dogs had just come out and kind of making a name for himself at this point. But it just it feels like a lot of sort of ideas that Tarantino had that just he deemed not worthy of his own movies. Yeah, and so he was willing to kind of just like seed control and be like, you know, yeah. you can run with it and I'll put my name on it and make some money off it. But yeah, because I got some like one liners in here that I think are pretty good. Yeah, I want yeah. people to know I wrote this, but I don't <laughs> care enough about it. Yeah, I'm too busy crafting my vision for Pulp Fiction, and then I'm never mm -hmm. going to let anyone else direct one of my movies ever again. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know. Well, actually, until Natural, Natural Born Star. Killers is the one I think that killed that dream. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure um okay nice um yeah interesting yeah I, I just feel like yeah when i look at it it's like it would have been better if direct tarantino had just directed it but to your point maybe he didn't feel like as you know the passion yeah. or whatever but it just would have been more cohesive and just the music and yeah just kind of a tighter vision it, it, i don't know it was just it was weird when it would go into just i agree like but i'm not even sure the early 90s this. yeah yeah it was uh it was interesting lots of cool lots of fun cameos though do you have any questions adam uh, sorry, I cut out again. So, oh uh, no, I, I have no questions. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, observations and musings. On to observations and musings. Uh, my only one is just that just we kind of already touched on this. But everything over here. Tarantino oh, just done. cannot not use the N word in his movies. It is yeah. incredible how consistent it is. I mean, he's is... even like cast himself as the guy who gets to say it. Yeah, the and then also times, like I think. And like, it seems like the bigger, like bigger and bigger and bigger actors, like compete for the roles where they get to say it. Yeah, it's it's an odd like, dynamic. Christopher Walken and Dennis Hopper. This was like the scene that they both like, like, it's just, it's, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just a bizarre dynamic to me and we don't need to talk about it too much. And I do find it a little interesting that we keep kind of basically referring to this as a Tarantino movie instead yeah. of a Tony Scott movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, he was the one who directed it, but the scripts and all the words we know were written by characters. Tarantino. So for this particular point, this is a Tarantino thing. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's just weird. And uh, yeah, definitely a little off putting. I just find it odd. We don't need to spend too much time on that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, no, all right, that was your only one. Yeah. I've got, I've got a few. Uh, one, the dialogue is just outrageous with the yes. references and just the like the over, like the over the top cool like speak, and it was just some of it was just preposterous. Um, uh, I never caught this before, but Alabama uh, is actually a Reservoir Dogs reference because uh, in Reservoir Dogs, Harvey Keitel's character talks about how he was with Alabama, but those. Those duos with a guy and a girl just never work out. So I never caught that before that this character is named Alabama. Cool, cool little inside thing there. Um, and yeah, we are kind of talked about how it's just like, to me, I feel like it's kind of this time capsule of 1993. You know, it's like this Gen X kind of takeover right around the time Nirvana is getting big. It's just like, it was just the edginess. I just feel like this movie is yeah. just brimming with in your face edginess, which now seems kind of very off-putting kind of at certain points or just kind of not like, I don't know. Um, but I, I definitely got the sense that, you know, this movie was trying really hard to like reinvent what cool was or, or Hollywood believed that Tarantino knew what cool was. I mean, all these actors competing to like say these ridiculous lines. And so it kind of interesting time capsule, like Bonnie and Clyde, how that was kind of, you know, a boundary pusher, which then a, a bunch of people tried to copy. Or even I was thinking recent example would be like knives out, like how, Knives Out kind of came okay. in and reinvented like a style and a type of movie that I feel like had kind of gotten really stale. And then Knives Out came in. And it was like, oh, wait, no, like detective movies are like cool again. And now like that's been tried to, you know, people have been trying to copy that now since since it came out. So, uh, yeah. And then my last thing is just Tom Sizemore, rest in peace, playing his cop like a total unhinged <laughs> psycho villain. Mm-hmm. Like literally they're like it's like they cast him to be like one of the coke like a coked out gangster and then tarantino was like oh no you're like the cop he's like well i'm gonna play it the same way <laughs> it's like all right yeah. <laughs> literally I, I thought of my character <laughs> i'm sticking with sticking it sticking with it mm-hmm. sticking with it mm-hmm. is that it how about, how about you adam do you have any observations i'm uh, i'm not gonna lie i have cut out like I, I think I missed the entire uh, section here of observations and musings. This is the first time it's been okay. here for more so, than five seconds. So if I, if, if I if I look bad when uh, you guys are talking about like Tarantino saying the N-word and stuff, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Internet, because I'm sure my, my face is oh, just you missed that. <laughs> it was a stimulating conversation. Um, yeah, it was just kind of how over the top in general this movie is. Every character is the most extreme version of that character um tony i mean not tony soprano uh <laughs> gandolfini. Uh, gandolfini is like the most gangster big guy you can think of alabama is the most like sex pot manic pixie yeah. dream girl manic yeah it's just action. like yeah <laughs> it's just everything is turned up to 11 every single character like uh christopher walken is so italian like he's just yeah. like he's wearing the sharpest suit it's a, it's a three like a he's got a, a three-piece suit he's got a scarf on he like tell like snaps at people to go get stuff done like it's just mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. very you know so i don't even, know that, yeah even like the at the very end that last little um monologue by um by the oh god no, i can't remember her name by alabama where it's like it, it like it ends with her just being like you're so cool you're so <laughs> yeah. cool you're like so that's what I want to hear. Cool, and it's just like that's like the that's the that's the end of the movie. That's the culmination of their love. Is just like you're that's so, so cool. cool. You're, you're so like, cool. oh my god, Tarantino. Like yeah, nobody said no to him. Clearly, the entire yeah. Life. This was a, yeah. It's another example of like somebody should have been like, hey man, pull it back. <laughs> or he or he sold it to the uh, to the studio and this director is doing it and be like, hey, maybe we shouldn't include some of this stuff. Like mm-hmm. how mad would he be? You know what I mean? Coming yeah, up the Reservoir Dogs or something. So, and I, I will just run it. And, It'll, it'll I was also thinking the narration over the top. I don't think Tarantino does that in a lot of or any of his other movies, really. I have characters narrate. I can't remember any. Does it happen in Django? I thought it did. I don't think so. I, I don't, don't think, think it's it ever does. like, and we did this and we had this fun. Like there's a, there's a there's um, montage. Yeah. But yeah. 
Um, I have to think. I don't. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, maybe that was a Tony Scott decision, or maybe Tarantino did that, and then he saw it and he was like, "I'm not doing that." Maybe again. Tarantino just thought, "Here's an opportunity to experiment with this because I'm not." Yeah, and then he like, "Nope, not cool, not cool, not cool, not doing yeah. it." <laughs> Could be. Uh, all right. Bits. Oh, and there's gonna be so many, like like all Tarantino movies. There are a lot. Nate, yeah. I know you've got a few uh, as well, so fire away. Uh, yeah, the two that I had were uh, the first one. Brad Pitt's character was the inspiration for the movie Pineapple Express, according to Judd Apatow. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. And James Gandolfini got an audition for The Sopranos because of his performance in this movie. Nice. Oh, yes. Wonderful. That's awesome. Because nice. you're kind of thinking it when you're watching it. But... Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, let's see. All right. I've got a few. Uh, Brad Pitt improvised most of his lines. Nice. Um, that's incredible. Any, right? so I right? love him so much in this movie. I would easily rewatch every scene that he's in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Over and over. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, I was going to, I didn't write this or I didn't check this one down, but uh, going off of um, James Gandolfini getting uh, Sopranos, uh, he originally was supposed to be cast as um, Tom Sizemore's character. And he, okay. uh, and then he eventually uh, got the other role and then recommended Tom Sizemore for that character. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I suppose the role he got just with that long scene with Patricia Arquette probably has more screen time. Yeah. Than yeah. Sizemore's role. Who's just kind of a, you know, just kind of out there. A crazy person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in a 2011 interview with uh, AFI, Gary Oldman was asked to name his favorite role. Oh he my chose, God. He chose Lee Harvey Oswald and JFK and Drexel Spivy. Oh my God. I think we watched that like this the scene where he like the scene that he's in. Uh-huh. Like, mm -hmm. And then I think I just turned to both of you and said, This is the same guy who played Winston Churchill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Academy yeah. Award he's winning Gary Oldman. Yeah. Um I actually do really like him in JFK. He's really good in that movie. Mm. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Gary Oldman met with Tony Scott about this project and told him he hadn't had a chance to read the script and then asked Scott what his part would be. And Scott told him, you're playing a white guy who thinks he's black and you're a killer pimp. <laughs> that was his direction. Yeah, pretty so much about like the energy of this movie. Yeah. Everyone yeah. Kind of scenes, how they view everything. Not yep. a lot of nuance needed. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, director Tony Scott gave Patricia Arquette the purple Cadillac as a gift after filming uh, because cool. the car she was driving uh kept breaking down which she brought up she was the, the only with... woman in the movie <laughs> and yeah. late to late to set and stuff um according to dennis hopper the only words improvised in the christopher walken scene uh the, the sicilian scene was eggplant and cantaloupe okay yeah all right that makes <laughs> just sense. Picked, uh, picked makes sense. Ones. okay um and some of the other ones are funny uh drew barrymore was the first kept choice for the role of alabama uh she was unavailable wow. so she didn't get it Interesting. Uh, Quentin that Tarantino revealed wild. that. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a few more. Uh, Quentin Tarantino revealed that Brooke Shields badly wanted the role of Alabama. Whew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, um, where's the other one I had? Uh, Tony Scott spent a year searching for the right actress to play Alabama. He considered and rejected Bridget Fonda, Diane Lane, Kira Sedgwick, and Julia Roberts. Some pretty wow. big names for the like I think he just I, none did of those the Julia fit. Roberts thing to say that he rejected Julia Roberts. <laughs> Maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's all it was about. Yeah, um, I'm gonna say yeah, I turned her down. She would I know she's been. the yeah, biggest well. actress in the world, but yeah, she would have felt yeah. so out of place in this movie. <laughs> oh, that's very yeah. strange. With the with like how the rest of her roles she's taken in her career, this would be well, she such played, an uh, out of she was in what's that pretty woman. Yeah, yeah but even that is like I think I didn't take Brooke I didn't take Brooke Shields classier this. than this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brooke Shields um, would have been really fun in this role. That would have been really mm -hmm. fun, yeah. Uh Liam Neeson turned down the role of Vicenzo Cancati, which is uh James Gandolfini's character. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I mean Gandolfini's good great. for this role, but man, that would have been fascinating. Dude. Yeah, yeah that would have been great. Um in, uh, in the trivia section of the DVD special features for this movie, Quentin Tarantino said he sold the script for about $10,000, which is with that money he bought the red Chevy Chevelle convertible that Vincent Vega drives in Pulp Fiction. Yeah, hmm. that sounds about right, but also sounds a little cheap, but only $10,000? Yeah. <laughs> he was in the 90s. Yeah, and he yeah. wasn't really known yet, I suppose. The movie only made like $12 million, barely broke mm -hmm. even, so... 
Yeah. And then the last one I have is similar goes off of what uh, Dylan said um, a little bit earlier that he actually brought up while we were watching the movie, which is pretty neat. Uh, Quentin Tarantino's original ending had Clarence dying in the gun battle, leaving Alabama a widow. Tarantino said that he intended Alabama to turn to crime to join with Mr. White, uh, a character from Reservoir Dogs. Uh, so that's in that there's a flashback scene where White asks about Alabama. So it was absolutely intentional. And this oh, is the ending of this. Yeah. amazing so that yeah. was originally she was going to be the only one who made it out alive and then goes on to have a life of crime man yep. adam can you imagine dylan's reaction to that tidbit if he hadn't put that together while we were watching this movie? <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah this would have been an amazing moment i She's literally like, stopped shit. the movie when i realized it so who knows what would have happened yeah you were like wait a second right wait a so second slam my laptop <laughs> yeah yeah no that was really neat I, I like that you caught that like right away like that scene happened and you immediately paused it we're like something clicked i've got it yeah so. yeah that was fun all right that's a right. great yeah, batch that's, of uh, yeah, that's what i got but yeah quite mm -hmm. a few tidbits kind of kind of fun that all these people that are in this movie oh sorry yep <laughs> didn't realize i paused i feel like it's been worse like on your side than sorry, for guys. the most part you've been fine from our point of view except obviously mm -hmm. you're not right now <laughs> <laughs> well, irony okay. of me saying that um are you are you able to put up our favorite image. Uh, I should be able to, yes. Uh, our favorite image. Me. It is time for. Well, bam! <laughs> it is time for the McCabe Code of Excellence. I just rewatched mm -hmm. this movie on Saturday, by the way. I, I thought I saw that on your letterbox. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's time for the McCabe Code of Excellence, where we give mm -hmm. out a glorious McCabe coat to mm -hmm. anybody involved with the movie who we believe exhibited excellence. We don't have to mm -hmm. give out a coat if we don't want to, and we each get mm -hmm. to give out our own. So, I guess I'll kick it off. I'm not giving out a coat for this movie. Fair First enough. First time in quite a while, I think, where I just don't... There wasn't any one part of it that made me feel like uh, it was coat-worthy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How about you, Adam? I think the only two performances that get close for Ooh. me are Brad Pitt. I, <laughs> I, I Brad just thought Pitt of that. And, I, uh, and Gary Oldman. <laughs> just I'm, yeah there's one for it to give it to brad pitt <laughs> if for, you want to give his... it to brad pitt then I, it makes me feel better about not i'm giving it to like brad pitt I, oh I it change Gary it. Oldman, all right nate just couldn't help himself he sees the coat there he thinks about brad pitt's performance it's just how good would brad pitt look <laughs> in that coat? Oh, yeah true <laughs> especially in this movie <laughs> ripping, yeah ripping a ball oh, on the man. couch in that coat <laughs> yes <laughs> so so many layers. Yep. So oh, I'm giving man. it to Brad Pitt for his like three scenes. Yeah. They're glorious. Yeah, so they are glorious. That one. I'll, then I'll give it to Gary Oldman because uh, I thought his his the scene that he's in and the device with the swinging lamp I thought was really oh, cool. I love and the lamp he, device. He disappeared yeah. into that role, which is kind of terrifyingly funny. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, similar Dylan. to you, Nate. I this movie is such a just scatter shot of good and bad. But it has no consistency. There's mm -hmm. no. There isn't like one. I mean, besides Brad Pitt, but he's barely on screen. And yep. so many people are just barely on screen and then it's so it was uh, it was hard for me to to pick and i also i am not going to give a mccabe code out for this movie okay um i was you know maybe tarantino could have gotten one but interesting weird little twist recently i read a thing with uh, tarantino i sent it to you guys where he talks about mccabe and mrs miller and he thinks that this that the mixing is really really bad and he I thinks that the worst sound mixed movies ever he said he likes the movie but like he can't get past how like terrible it sounds just for that um for that extra thing i think there's there's a little salt between mccabe and tarantino so no no coat for this movie no coat for you no, no coat for you all right, Hopefully totally fair. Too. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to give one until Adam reminded me about Brad Pitt, and that's just, <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. Yeah, it's, it's he's too funny. That's yeah, for that's sure. Such a good element. All right, uh, on to closing statements, and mm -hmm. mine is really just uh, I, this is the first movie that we've done on this show in a long time mm -hmm. that I think I was more negative than positive on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for me, you got to go back to like Suspiria. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, so, if, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, I, I think this is the first time where I got done with it. And I thought like, man, that just really wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's okay. I didn't hate I didn't... it, but it's, you know, I probably won't watch it again. Yeah, I could have predicted that. I think <laughs> with our tastes, I was like, I, yeah. I'm going in. I was like, I don't know if Nate's going to like this, but it was still fun. You know, that's what this podcast is for. Trying. Well, we had just got, like the weekend things. before we had just watched a couple sort of madcap 
movies and I was kind of in that space. We were but doing then, well. Obviously, you had seen the movie before, so there were some things you knew about it that I did not. But yeah. I went into it like fully expecting to like this movie. Mm -hmm. Same. Same. And I think I'm kind of in the same vein. I, I didn't necessarily like this. I probably won't ever watch it again. Um Unless I'm trying to watch like a few scenes, and I think I said yeah. that uh, while I was while we were watching, I said that to you guys, like, hey, if I ever revisit this movie, it's going to be because of this scene for this actor. Check that out, and then probably bail. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, because I'd give it like a three, like it it met the expectations. Like I was like, okay, that was zany, that was wild, but it didn't really grab me. It didn't really do anything for me. So like, yes, that was I. That's what I expected it to be, and it met that. But it's not that great. Mm. If that yeah. makes sense. So, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'd set it like a three or something. I know we don't we don't add mm -hmm. um, our star ratings here necessarily, but um, it's just it's not it's just in the middle. It's just in mm -hmm. the middle. Uh, yeah, mine is uh, True Romance is a roller coaster of a movie that is mostly a collection of long scenes that everyone in Hollywood apparently wanted a piece of. Uh, <laughs> ultimately, feels dated and simply lacks the cohesion of Tarantino's uh, other movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that he's written. Uh, probably yeah. he didn't direct it, <laughs> but. Uh yeah, right. so this was still fun. I'm well, glad we, we did uh, it. I'm glad I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Same. There was, mm -hmm. you know, there's some yeah. positive stuff that I took out of it. I love this Brad Pitt performance. That's a, that's what I'm taking home with me. Yeah. And now you get you get all the references mm -hmm. to Gary Oldman's character and performance. Yes, that and too. How, like like in Barry, there's a whole scene that references it, which is really. I need funny. to rewatch that now. Yeah, you should. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> um, all right. Well, this was fun. Uh, is it uh, my turn to put a wrap on the show? And wait, let's remind them before we go about next Just week. Just a really quick reminder that our our movie for next week will be City Lights, starring, written, directed, produced, edited, everything <laughs> by Charlie Chaplin. Uh -huh. Really excited for that. It's going to be my first Chaplin movie. I think you guys as well. Probably yeah. outside of like probably a little five minute scene I saw of Modern Times mm -hmm. in high school or something. So mm -hmm. really looking forward to that. Same, same. It's going to be very exciting. Hard left turn from True Romance. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, all right. I'll take it away here. I like you, Clarence. Always have, always will. <laughs>